Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the first SIAC Japan webinar. Um, this webinar is entitled Negotiating Arbitration Agreements, Selecting the Most Advantageous Arbitral Seat and Governing Law. My name is Michelle Sonin and I am the head of Northeast Asia at the Singapore International Arbitration Center uh, and I'll be your moderator uh, for today's session. Um, as the name implies, the name of the session implies, today we're going to be discussing the roles of the arbitral sheet, seat and of the laws applicable to various aspects of the arbitration um, in order to help companies and practitioners make really informed choices uh, when you're drafting our, your arbitration agreements. We have an excellent panel of arbitration specialists and in-house counsel with us this afternoon. Um, and if I could start by first introducing everybody. Uh, we have Mr. Nicholas Lingard, and perhaps Nick, you could give a little wave. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Nicholas Lingard, a partner at Freshfields, uh, Brookhouse and Derringer, and he is based in Singapore. He is also the head of the firm's international arbitration practice in Asia. We also have Ms. Yoshimi Ohara. Um, there we go. <laughs> Yoshimi is a partner at Nagashima Ono and Tsunematsu in Japan. Um, we have Masako Takahata. Um, Masako is general counsel at IDI Infrastructures in Japan. Uh, last, but not not, last but not least, uh, we have Mr. Paul Tan, a partner at the Raja and Tan Law Firm in Singapore uh, and a member of the Young SIAC Committee. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon. Um, all these panelists have really extensive experience in international arbitration, uh, and I'm delighted to hear their advice and insights on selecting the arbitral seat uh, and the, the laws that will be applicable during the arbitration. So without further ado, let's go ahead um, and get started. Uh, if I could start by by posing a question to to Yoshimi, yes. um, you know, <laughs> as an international arbitration practitioner, one of the most commonly heard terms is arbitral seat. Um, it's fundamental to international arbitration. But for those that have more limited experience um, or or background in international arbitration, the concept could actually be quite foreign. Could you briefly explain what the arbitral seat is and why it matters? Yes, um, Michelle, thank you very much for the introduction. This is my very first webinar, and I'm very much excited about it. So talking about the seat of arbitration, it is quite important. You always see seat of arbitration in the arbitration agreement of the underlying agreement. What is the seat of arbitration? That is the legal home of arbitration. By that, I mean the seat of the law of the seat would apply to arbitration proceedings and court of the seat will act as guardian of arbitration proceedings. That means that the, the court of the seat will enforce the arbitration agreement and enforce the arbitration award, which means if party who is unhappy with the outcome of the arbitration will apply for to set aside the arbitration and the seat, the court of the seat will decide whether arbitral award should be set aside or not. The last point I want to make is the local practice of arbitration. It is quite important to bear in mind what kind of practice of arbitration you find in the seat because indirectly the practice of the arbitration practice of the seat could affect your arbitration proceedings. So for example, if it is the seat in the common law jurisdiction, common law practice could affect, could somewhat involve in the arbitration proceedings. Whereas if the seat is in the civil law jurisdiction, that practice could affect your proceedings. This may not um, necessarily happen, but it's always interesting to ask questions to practitioners in different jurisdictions, say for example, how long your hearing usually takes. If you ask the arbitration practitioner in common law jurisdiction, they could usually say that a week or it could be two weeks. But if you ask the same question to the arbitration practitioner of civil law jurisdiction, they could say, well, it could take a week or two. So 
to some extent, the local practice um, of deceit would affect your arbitration proceedings. That's something you may wish to think about um, in addition to the law and the court of deceit in deciding the seat of arbitration. Thank you. Um, just to, to maybe I can ask Paul, is there anything you might want to add to help explain the role of deceit and its importance in an arbitration? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Michelle, and, and also to the SIAC for, for having me. Um, this is also, I think, my first uh, webinar experience as, as a speaker, so it's, it's great to be with um, all, of, all of you. Um, so the, the arbitral seat um, is, I think, one of the uh, more, most important uh, considerations, although sometimes people don't pay as much attention to it um, as they should. Um, I think most of us will understand that uh, there are two schools of thought here. One, one which um, says that the seat um, has control over the proceedings, uh, is the source of uh, law and, and obligations, particularly in relation to the procedure um, that should apply to the um, arbitration. There's um, there's another school of thought which um, seeks to de-emphasize, I think, the importance of the, the seat in favor of the jurisdictions in which uh, enforcement may occur. Um, in, as far as the, the Singapore law perspective is concerned, uh, which I think is, is, is in line with the majority of, of jurisdictions, um, it, there is still a very strong emphasis on the, the law of the seat, uh, on, the, on the seat and the law uh, that therefore applies. So as um, uh, Yoshimi was, was explaining, um, there are different ways in which the, um, the curial law, the law of the seat um, applies to an arbitration. Um, first of all, it can determine um, the subject matter that is capable of um, arbitration. Um, and that's because you could get challenges right at the start as to whether this is an arbitration agreement um, that is enforceable. Um, you could also get setting aside at the end, which says that this, this whole dispute was not arbitrable to begin with. So that's, that's an important uh, consideration, particularly when one has um, slightly uh, more interesting disputes, let's say over uh, intellectual property patterns, uh, winding up uh, disputes and, and you know, minority oppression disputes and, and disputes along those lines, where not every jurisdiction agrees um, whether or not these sorts of disputes are arbitrable. So that's, that's one way in which it could quite um, significantly affect um, an arbitration. Um, the, the seat also provides uh, interim measures where it may not be possible to get that relief from the tribunal um, in time or where the tribunal has not yet been constituted or for some reason um, is incapable of being constituted. Uh, and this, again, could be uh, very important strategically for, um, for parties in terms of uh, measures to conserve the status quo. That's one. Yeah, anti-suit injunctions, anti-arbitration injunctions, you know, subpoenaing of witnesses and so on. So again, um, the, where you seat your arbitration uh, determines uh, whether or not these reliefs are possible, available, in what circumstances, um, and so on. Uh, yeah, and finally, I suppose um, it's, it's about uh, setting aside as well, uh, which is uh, where the seats uh, are, are very important, uh, both in terms of the grounds for setting aside, uh, but also the standard that is applied in, in setting aside. Um, and one can think of, for example, you know, public policy. Uh, you will find many uh, jurisdictions disagree as to what the standard for public policy uh, announcements uh, should be whether you apply the domestic conceptions of public policy or whether you apply international uh, norms or understandings of public policy. Um, so, again, so that's, again, uh, I think another illustration as to how important the choice of the seat uh, can be. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'll just stop here. Uh, and yeah, no, that's, that's very helpful. Um, just, a, you know, just a few follow-up questions, yeah. maybe Yoshimi. Um, you know, sometimes arbitration agreements don't actually specify the seat. Could you tell us what happens in that situation when the arbitration agreement is actually silent on the seat? Sure. Usually, you know, even if they fail to agree on the seat of arbitration, 
Um, they usually agree to the arbitration institutions, which institutional rules should apply to the arbitration proceedings. In most cases, those arbitration uh, institutional rules provide how to choose the seat when um, arbitration agreement is silent on the seat. Depending on the arbitration institution, um, tribunal decides the seat or institution decides the seat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In case parties didn't agree on the arbitration institutions, arbitral, arbitration law of the seat would come in and in most cases, um, including um, those arbitration law consistent with procedural model law, mm -hmm. the tribunal decides the seat of arbitration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would, I would just point out here, rule, the SEAC rules, Rule 21.1, um, to say that, you know, where the parties haven't agreed um, on the seat, then the seat of arbitration shall be determined by the tribunal, having due regard to all the circumstances of the case. Maybe, Paul, could you talk a little bit about what, you know, what that means when you say having due regard for all circumstances of the case? <laughs> well, it... Um, it means what it says, I suppose. <laughs> but that, but that's, a, that's a very interesting uh, rule, which, um, as, as you would know, uh, is actually uh, different to the predecessor rules of 2013. Um, and that was actually the subject matter of uh, a dispute um, that, that went all the way up to our highest court in Singapore, where um, the, at the high court level, the first level in court, um, the judge placed some emphasis on the on the side the former side rules, which had said that in the in, in the absence of agreement between the parties, the the default would be Singapore, uh, and so he read um, the agreement, which merely said uh, SIAC rules in Shanghai. Uh, he read that as saying it's Singapore seat, uh, and the reference to Shanghai was merely a reference to the venue the physical place uh, where the proceedings would be conducted. Um, the, the other consideration for the judge, uh, and I think the tribunal as well, was that had they chosen uh, uh, Chinese law, PRC law, uh, it would have invalidated the arbitration agreement. And so they felt that uh, the parties could not have intended uh, a choice of seat uh, and, and the law governing the arbitration agreement that would have resulted in, in the arbitration proceedings being invalidated. Uh, it went up to uh, the Court of Appeal. Uh, court of Appeal disagreed um, and said that uh, in, in most clauses, the reference to a geographical location is not intended to be uh, a reference to venue, but uh, a reference to seat. Uh, so they actually read that as, as a pretty much an express uh, choice of, of uh, seat. Um, in, in the circumstances and said that, that, that therefore it was Shanghai that was supposed to have been the seat, notwithstanding the reference to the SIAC rules. Uh, sure, so, sure. so I guess to come back to your, to your, to your question, now that, that we don't have a default in the side yeah. rule. Uh, yeah, what I, are tribunals looking at when they're looking at you know, the, the due certain, all the circumstances of the case? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I suppose they will, they will look at, at the language um, that that um, you know, is used in the arbitration agreement. Uh, I think they would look at the parties uh, mm -hmm. who are there. Uh, I think a very strong factor would be um, the, whether or not the, the, the chosen seat would um, be a neutral one, uh, whether it would be something which you expect the parties uh, on both sides to, to actually choose, uh, mm -hmm. or whether it would result in, in an application of pure law that I, I think would result in sort of a, strange uh, outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think they really do look at, uh, and they will also look at where the parties are located, uh, the, the, the substance of the agreement and the dispute that has arisen. So it's really looking at all the, all the factors to, to find something which is, is the most commonsensical, uh, although that's a matter of uh, subjectivity sometimes. Sure, sure. Yeah.
Well, thanks, um, thanks Yoshimi and Paul for that, that helpful uh, primer on, on arbitral seat. Um, if we could now turn to, to think about, you know, what, what are the considerations that you take into account when you're actually negotiating the arbitration agreement and selecting the seat? Um, Masako, as, as general counsel, um, you know, at, what, what are the kinds of things that you and your team are, are looking for and that you're, you know, you're, you're taking into account when you're negotiating these arbitration agreements? Thank you, Michelle. Um, if I uh, would, uh, you know, um, um, select any sort of, you know, uh, arbitral seat, uh, I would say, you know, um, um, you know, um, it's a sort of, you know, uh, court interference. I mean, mm -hmm. minimum and supportive, you know, court, court interference uh, should be the uh, key factor. Because you know, um, you know, in most of the cases, you know, we can uh, easily as uh, you know choose a kind of a, you know, uh, uh, so-called you know, uh, you know, um, uh, neutral or impartial, you know, uh, you know, uh, seat or you know, third-party country uh, mm -hmm. seat. But you know, um, I I would say you know. Um, we need to, you know, uh, research on the kind of uh, legal infrastructure of the um, um, court, uh, court interference or court, court attitude toward sure. to the arbitration proceedings uh, in that region or the country. Sure, yeah. So the courts, the experience of the courts and the, the track record of the courts courts playing, you know, being supportive of arbitration is, is a key yeah. factor for you folks. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's so important since, you know, uh, we usually, uh, you know, uh, when something went wrong, you know, we need to consider about the kind of interim right. measures or any sort of, uh, at the end of the day, we need to consider the, how to enforce uh, the arbitral award or something right. like that. Uh, when it comes to the, you know, um, um, arbitration, uh, the seat of the uh, arbitration, you know, um, we need to uh, think about that. Yeah, of course, sure. And I, I also uh, would like to add something uh, here, uh, you know, for the purpose of the uh, arbitration rule, uh, since, you know, I found, you know, the specific provisions for the interim uh, court order, the interim measures provisions, um, under the International Arbitration Act of Singapore, uh -huh. it's great since you know it's specified states. You know it's applicable to the arbitration proceedings, irrespective yeah. of whether the place of arbitration is in the territory of Singapore. Are you are you speaking about the uh, emergency arbitrator? No, it's, uh, it's uh, you know Singapore law. Singapore law. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I'm not sure if this is what you're referring to, but just for the benefit of the audience, you know, Singapore um, has enacted legislation that makes emergency yeah. uh, arbitrator awards uh, enforceable. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, it's, it was one of the first jurisdictions to do that. Um, Nick, you know, from the practitioner's perspective, um, is there anything you might add to what are the, what are the key factors that companies and, and people negotiating arbitration agreements should think about when they're selecting the seat? I think in, in reality, Michelle, either um, this is taken for granted, there is a position. We see many of our clients have a standard preferred position. They go for Singapore, they go for Hong Kong, they go for London, they go for Paris. Or it, it's a rather unseemly matter of horse trading. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the horse trading, what matters? Well, it seems to me what matters are the things that, that everybody already has said. Neutrality matters. Access to good courts in support of the arbitration matter. I want to say one thing, though, that does not matter, and I know we'll come on to this, but I think it's important to inject it now, mm -hmm. and that is geography because the seat of arbitration uh, need not be the place where anybody in fact sits in connection with the arbitration. The discussion that Yoshimi, Paul and, and, and Masako have been having is about a legal construct, the legal seat of arbitration, not about a geographical one. Uh, and one could therefore agree a Singapore seat of arbitration for all the reasons that have been outlined, uh, but for convenience choose to hold the arbitration for sake of example in Tokyo, hold right. the hearings in, in Tokyo. Uh, and so I want to make that distinction that I think that ought not 
be a focus uh, in the negotiation of the seat uh, convenience of, of venue because the two can be uh, can quite easily and sometimes are separated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think those are those are really useful points, um, which is a nice segue into my next topic, which is venue. Um, what you're referring to a second ago is that you know the the seat being the legal home of the arbitration um, does not necessarily need to actually be the physical home of the of the hearings in the arbitration. Um, and the, the physical place where you would hold the arbitration is, is venue. And maybe Masako, um, you know, do you have any experience where you held the arbitration in a place other than the seat? And why might, why might parties want to do that? Um, yes, you know, venue is obviously a, a location where the hearing session will be held. Um, the party might uh, want a different venue. Um, you know, I mean, uh, different from, you know, um, the seat of arbitration uh, when um, more, uh, when uh, the seat uh, itself is not a kind of a um, convenient place, I mean, uh, from logistic perspective. Um, the ideal venue should be, um, other than the, you know, uh, consideration for the purpose of the seat of arbitration, uh, in, uh, I think it's uh, in close uh, proximity uh, to the headquarters of the company because yeah. it's so important for the senior management teams, uh, you know, uh, to feel uh, some sort of uh, empathy or you know understanding of the arbitral tribunal, mm -hmm. and, uh, which uh, could uh, you know uh, help to make uh, the case uh, predictable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when it comes to the, uh, you know, um, weakness of the pact, I, I mean, uh, everyone knew that choosing a right person as a witness of the pact uh, mm -hmm. is a, a kind of a key to win the case. Mm -hmm. He or she might be a once a project manager when the project started and mm -hmm. uh, got promoted to a senior officer when mm -hmm. something went wrong in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, it is highly likely that his or her uh, schedule is packed and hard to arrange a week-long hearing. You know. Right, so. right. So you, you know, so you might have uh, the seat, um, for example, in Singapore, uh, but you being, you know, general counsel of a Japanese company, perhaps you're going to try to have the venue at, for example, JIDRC in Tokyo. Yeah. Um, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's so uh, convenient. Then, right, right. And, it's, and I'm sure it must save costs as well um, for, mm. for the company not having to, to send all of, you know, senior management down down to another location. Sure. Um, all right. You know, Paul, just a quick question. Do you do parties actually need to specify venue in their contract? What happens if they don't? Uh, no, no, I don't. I don't think they need to. Um, and um, I, I don't think there's also necessarily one venue uh, that, it, that parties might choose or the tribunal might, might ask for uh, that would be used uh, through the lifetime of the proceedings. I mean, there are, there are many cases in which um, some procedural hearings, for example, are held in uh, one country, um, the next phase is held in another, the third phase held in some, somewhere else. Um, and sometimes that is because of where the parties and the tribunal are at any one particular point in time. Uh, we're just trying to find the most uh, convenient place for, for everyone. It may depend on whether the witnesses, as Masako has said, you know, are, are needed. And if so, mm -hmm. where the balance of the witnesses are uh, mm -hmm. at that point in time. So, sure. so I, I probably would not, uh, in advance of a dispute, stipulate mm -hmm. what, where the venue should be. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think as the, the experience of the VNA case also shows, there is a danger that, that if you are expressing geographical locations in the agreement, uh, which are not intended to be a reference to the seat, uh, mm -hmm. could end up in a situation in which uh, it causes confusion to right. someone who is not privy to that discussion right. uh, you know, as to what the parties really intended. So, yeah. so, I don't, so A is not necessary, B I probably wouldn't do it. Um, and, and to keep that uh, open, I think for discussion, as the proceedings um, happen and, and, and develop. Sure, sure. Okay, well, thank you um, all for those topics. Any other points on arbitral seat before we, before we move on to a new topic? I might make one observation, if I may, yeah. Michelle, which is just this. 
I think we will see more and more of what Paul has just said. That is to say, uh, somewhat unexpected venues for hearings. The conversation we're all having now is how we deal with virtual hearings and okay. we're getting through or we are getting through virtual hearings as the case may be but as the world gradually reopens and it's possible to travel some places but not others i think the tenor of the conversation will be well we had agreed a seat of x we had previously agreed a venue of y but the only place all the council team uh, witnesses and tribunal can get to is z so right. we will instead hold hold the hearing in z i think i think there will be more and more of that yeah, and then maybe even like Paul mentioned, these smaller hearings as opposed to, to you know, what we've been used to with these one week, two week long, get it all done at one time, maybe breaking right. it up into smaller pieces is just going to become more of the reality. Well, thank you for those comments. Um, Let's let's talk now about about governing law. Along with arbitral seat, governing law is going to play a very important role in uh, determining, you know, in your arbitration proceeding. Um, so maybe we could start with Nick. What could you explain the role of the governing law and how it differs differs from the law of the seat and and why that matters? Of course, governing law is what determines the substance of the dispute. You sometimes hear the expression substantive law of the contract. Uh, to put that in simpler terms, uh, was there a breach of contract? That question is to be answered by reference to the substantive governing law of the contract. What are the elements of establishing a breach of contract or defending a breach of contract claim? Those questions are to be answered by reference to the substantive governing law of the contract, not the procedural law, which emerges from, uh, in the typical understanding, the law of the seat. All the questions that were outlined at the beginning of our discussion, procedural questions. Uh, to give another example to draw the distinction, a procedural question is, are these proceedings confidential? That question will be answered either by the arbitral rules or the party's agreement, but if those two are silent, by the law of the seat. It's a procedural mm -hmm. question. It won't be answered by the substantive governing law of the contract. The mm -hmm. substantive governing law of the contract uh, will answer the core question: uh, right. Has there been a breach of has there been a breach of contract uh, in the case before the tribunal? Right, right. So you know, when you're talking about governing law and a contract that fails to actually specify the governing law, that puts us into the territory of conflict of laws. Um, could you try to explain it briefly, what conflicts of law is and, and when you might need to turn to that kind of uh, tricky analysis? That, that, that's, that's a vexed question, Michelle, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Uh, perhaps, <laughs> some, perhaps some context first. Parties usually make an express choice of governing law. That's the starting point. Mm -hmm. And there, there is no complication. This contract and any non-contractual uh, obligations in connection with it shall be governed by the laws of New York, the laws of England and Wales, the laws of Japan. Typical case. Mm -hmm. I want to make three other points before coming exactly to your question, Michelle. Three exceptions to that usual case. One is even where there has been an express election of a governing law, that may not be the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And I think too often uh, parties and indeed some council forget this. There is a role for so-called mandatory law, that you can choose law only so far. There are some laws that you simply cannot contract out of. Uh, I've said my contract is governed by English law, but I'm selling goods into Japan for sake of example, though of course I defer to Yoshimi and Moscow, and some Japanese law will be mandatory. And the debate that's been uh, had over the past several years has been around Japanese competition law, for example, in the context of energy sales into Japan in a contract governed by New York or English law. There may still be a role for Japanese law there because there is commerce in Japan, and uh, something other than the governing law is relevant. So I note that for completeness. Second, I, I, I also want in the spirit of completeness to say, we sometimes see over complicated clauses, not just a single selection of governing law, but a selection of one or more. We spent many years litigating a, a, a case under a contract that provided for the governing law to be the common principles of English and French law. Uh, unsurprisingly, the, the great part of the litigation was determining what are the common principles of English and French law. The third uh, point, though, then, is exactly yours, and that is a case of silence 
uh, uh, Michelle, where, where there is nothing at all uh, in the contract as to what law governs the substantive questions. And it's there that we go into the conflicts of law analysis. Let me say briefly how I understand the core of the, the Singapore conflicts of law analysis. It, it proceeds in three stages. The first is, is there an express choice of, is there an express choice of governing law? Uh, and if there is, there will be no complication. Uh, it will govern. The second is, is there an implied choice of governing law? And that question gets at the party's intentions. Can we assume from something in the contract that they uh, uh, impliedly chose a governing law? That might be references to language, might be references to a particular court to resolve the dispute. It might even be reference to a seat of arbitration. The third step then is close but different. And it's an objective assessment. It's not about parties' intentions, but about what objectively is the legal system that has the closest and most real connection to the contract. Uh, and the tribunal has to ask itself that question objectively, uh, uh, based on close, closest and most real connection, and then apply that law to the substantive questions in issue. Tribunals might look at the place the contract was made, the place it was to be performed, the places of the parties there, um, uh, jurisdictions of incorporation or residence, the nature of the contract. Mm -hmm. In Singapore, the, the, the key case uh, is a high court case, not a court of appeal case uh, from the mid 90s, uh, which I like for its content. It's a case called Las Vegas Hilton uh, about a, 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 a high rolling gambler uh, from Malaysia, who in Singapore uh, concluded an oral contract with a representative of a Las Vegas casino, uh, effectively to enjoy a first class junket to Las Vegas, uh, provided that he gambled enough at the casino in Las Vegas. He was also advanced some credit by the casino and didn't uh, pay back those facilities. The casino brought a claim against him in the Singapore court. And the question was, well, clearly there was no express choice of governing law. Uh, what law would govern? Was it Malaysian law because he was from Malaysia? Was it Singapore law because they met and struck their deal in Singapore? Or was it Nevada law? Mm -hmm. That's where the casino was, Las Vegas. That's where the action took place. Uh, and the court ultimately held on three get into the third step objectively the closest connection was Nevada uh, and Nevada law therefore applied and this has real consequences in that case uh, it was assumed that Singapore law uh, had uh, a public policy against gambling such that the contract may not be enforceable and of course Nevada law uh, had no such thing putting aside whether that was a correct assumption of Singapore law you could see if that were right uh, it would have real impacts on on the case but that's that's how the analysis proceeded there and very briefly i will say as i understand it and again i speak under the control of yoshimi and masako as i understand it the japanese analysis proceeds broadly similarly under article seven and eight uh, of the japanese act on the general rules for application of laws uh, article seven being if the parties have agreed a choice of law, that is the law that shall apply. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it by judicial pronouncement, that can be either an express or an implied choice. And then Article 8 of the Act goes to a version of what in Singapore is uh, the, 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 the closest connection test, the law of the place at which the Act, that is the legal Act, is most closely connected at its time. Uh, is the Japanese test. So broadly speaking, uh, in simplification, uh, uh, a similar analysis looking to objectively speaking, the, the closest connection. Yeah, I'd, that be does to, yeah I'd be happy to confirm that, you know, Nick's um, marvelous observation was entirely accurate um, talking about the governing law of Japan. Thank you. The choice of law. I breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> yeah, I was so impressed. Um, well, it does sound like a very complicated and uh, lengthy, potentially lengthy analysis. So Masako, as general counsel, is it fair to say you would try to avoid uh, going through a conflicts of law analysis and, and select a governing law in the contract? <laughs> 
Yeah, that's true. You know, yeah, you know, I'm always put the governing law clause uh, if there is silence on the governing law to avoid an um, unnecessary discussion. Uh, since right. you know, usually it's not so hard to agree on some sophisticated country's law, uh, the governing law. Okay, and then just yeah, to... of course you know, uh, but you know, it's uh, it's very uh, common that the governing law of the contract is different from the laws of. At the seat of adaptation. Right, different considerations. One, again, yeah. procedural and one substantive. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for that, Nick and Masako and Yoshimi. Um, let's, let's move on to talk about the um, to talk about the law of the arbitration agreement. Um, this is a yet another type of law that's applicable in your arbitration and perhaps Yoshimi could could start us off by explaining how this how the law of the arbitration agreement works in your arbitration. Right. So this is a very important point because you know in-house counsel then when they agree to governing law of the underlining agreement they thought that's the end of the story. They have decided every governing law that is not the case because arbitration agreement could have a separate governing law. And I noticed that some arbitration institution encourage parties to agree to um, governing law of the arbitration agreement specifically to avoid any future disputes over the governing law of the arbitration agreement then what is the governing law of arbitration agreement? Is it different from the governing law of underlining contract? I mean, it is different in the sense that as Nick have, has, you know, wonderfully, you know, explained, governing law of the underlining contract defines the rights and obligations of the parties of the underlining contract. Whereas the governing law of arbitration agreement decides, decides the formality or validity of arbitration agreement, or capacity of the parties to conclude arbitration agreement. So the interpretation and validity of arbitration agreement depends on this governing law of arbitration agreement, which could be different from the governing law of underlining contract, because the governing law, the purpose of the governing law of arbitration agreement and the purpose of governing law of underlining contract is different. And looking at the Japanese court, mm -hmm. so there's a Supreme Court decision issued in 1997, which provides that, which held that if the parties arbitration, the underlining agreement doesn't provide the governing law. And when the arbitration agreement doesn't provide the governing law, perhaps the court can interpret the party's intent in a way that because the party chose New York as the seat of arbitration, party have agreed or the implicitly the party agree to choose the New York law as the governing law of arbitration agreement. So if this if the parties do not specifically agree to the governing law of arbitration agreement, the Japanese court will apply the seat of arbitration, the, 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 the law of the seat um, as the governing law of arbitration agreement. Yeah, thank you for me. Um, Paul, is that consistent with the, with the Singapore approach? Yeah, well, the, the Singapore approach um, has followed uh, the position that was expressed um, by the English courts in South America, uh, mm -hmm. which I think gives more emphasis uh, to the law of the contract uh, in the absence of an express uh, stipulation as to the law of the arbitration agreement. So the, the, the starting presumption is that if you haven't specified the law of the arbitration agreement, uh, the, that the law of the contract will, will be assumed or presumed uh, to also apply to the law of the arbitration agreement, uh, okay. unless there is something else uh, that indicates that it should not be. Uh, and I think this is so even if uh, the curial law, the law of the seat, is different from the law of the arbitration agreement, uh, sorry, of, of the, the, the governing law. 
Um, sure. So, so that's a pretty strong uh, presumption. Uh, okay. This is, I think, that uh, the logic being that. Uh, you know, if, you, if parties have agreed the governing law of the contract, why wouldn't they have expected that to extend uh, mm -hmm. to the arbitration agreement as well? Uh, mm -hmm. And I think superficially, many, many people um, often make that assumption, which, as Shimi has said, is probably not correct. Uh, and, and I think you're going to get on to it. Uh, the, the English position has, has shifted somewhat. Um, yeah. so, so, but... We, we have not, as, as the law is right now, um, as of, I think, December last year, um, our highest court has endorsed uh, that approach um, that, that, um, that I've just described. Okay. And I know there was a very recent uh, English court decision on this topic. Um, and Nick, if you could, you could summarize and explain the implications of that court decision, and we can see the comparative view of Singapore, Japan, um, and, the, and the English position. Uh, of course, uh, I'll be happy to. I wonder if I begin the explanation by making a very basic conceptual point, which mm -hmm. is the entry point to this conversation. The arbitration clause is typically understood to be severable, separable from the rest of the contract. Why is that? If the rest of the contract is somehow tainted by fraud, for example, the arbitration clause can still be used to resolve that question. And so the foundational proposition is arbitration clause is generally understood to be severable from the rest of the contract so that it can still work, it's still operable, even if there is some fundamental problem uh, that goes to the validity of the rest of the contract. So that's, I make that uh, basic conceptual point because I think it's a, an important entryway to the discussion. The recent English case does indeed take the English position uh, to very similar to the Japanese position that uh, Yoshimi has described. It's a case called Enka v Chubb. Enka, like the Japanese song, uh, and Chubb, uh, the insurance company. It's a case uh, relating to an insurance dispute over the construction of a power plant in Russia. The contract uh, at issue provided for ICC arbitration in London. It did not have an express choice of governing law of the substantive rights and obligations of the contract, nor of the arbitration clause. The insurer commenced proceedings in the court in Moscow, uh, and Enka, the construction company, uh, went to the London court to seek an anti-suit injunction to stop that litigation in Moscow. Anchor, the construction company, said, we have a valid arbitration clause that provides for ICC arbitration in London, uh, and you, London court, therefore should stop the Moscow litigation because it has been commenced by the insurance company in breach of this arbitration clause. Uh, ultimately, the Court of First Instance having uh, held differently, the Court of Appeal uh, determined uh, that the law as it had been expressed hitherto in England, uh, Paul summarised it arising out of a case called Sul America and several following it, uh, was mistaken as a matter of principle, the Court of Appeal said, uh, and held ultimately uh, that the parties, there is a strong presumption that the parties have made an implied choice of the law of the seat to govern their arbitration clause. If you recall the three steps of conflicts of law analysis I went through already, this is in the second step. Have the parties made an implied choice of the law to govern, here the law to govern their arbitration clause, uh, and the Court of Appeal in England, in this case, Enka v Chubb, said the answer will be yes, they have made an implied choice of governing law, and that implied choice will be the law of the seat, uh, where um, there is a seat specified. And in that case, the parties had agreed London as the seat. That meant that English law governed the arbitration clause, and the, the English court went on to determine uh, that the insurance company had indeed breached the arbitration clause by commencing litigation in Moscow, uh, and therefore uh, the English court issued an anti-suit injunction uh, 
uh, with respect to the Moscow proceedings. Now, this question, this case, I think, nicely demonstrates why the question of governing law of the arbitration clause is important. Uh, it answers important questions like, is there a valid arbitration agreement? That question, uh, on the English court's analysis, is not answered by the substantive governing law of the contract. Uh, what is the scope of the arbitration clause? And that was a key point in the Enka v Chubb case, because at least the insurance company's position was if Russian law governed the arbitration clause, uh, then they would not have breached it by commencing the Moscow litigation, because they said the Moscow litigation uh, was a series of tort claims that if one applied Russian law to interpret the arbitration clause would be excluded from the arbitration clause uh, and there therefore would not have been a breach by having commenced the, uh, the Moscow litigation. Conversely, because English law applied, London having been the seat, the court had no difficulty determining ultimately that there was a breach because even tort claims were caught uh, by the arbitration clause. Of course, this uh, law, the governing law of the arbitration clause, is also the law that answers the question, uh, as in Enka v Chubb, uh, has the arbitration clause been breached? There, the answer was yes, and thus the anti-suit injunction was issued. Uh, as Paul has alluded to, this now is a departure from the Singapore position. But interestingly, I make this only as a footnote, and again, I speak under the control of Paul as the Singapore lawyer, and a reversion, as it were, to, to what I understand to have been the original Singapore position uh, some time ago in a decision by an assistant registrar, not by a judge, but a decision by an assistant registrar back in 2014, uh, a case called First Link Investments, uh, where the assistant registrar in Singapore adopted an analysis uh, really very similar indeed to what we've now seen from the English Court of Appeal. But that analysis has since been displaced in Singapore uh, and at least as we sit here today, uh, the English law position and the Singapore law position are in divergence. London, uh, England aligning with Japan, uh, mm -hmm. Singapore not, Singapore going back to the substantive governing law of the contract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. So it does seem like, you know, you've really got the um, rules applicable to law of the arbitration agreement in flux. Um, Paul, Masako, any, oh, Yoshimi, comments. Yes. <laughs> yes, just to um, add some clarification to the Supreme Court decision position of Japan. Um, yes, as um, just like English, the Japanese Supreme Court found the implied um, agreement between the choice of seat by the parties and uh, putting emphasis on the seat of arbitration, the uh, Supreme Court decided that New York law should apply. Um, in deciding whether, uh, deciding the scope of arbitration agreement. But in finding implied um, agreement between the parties, um, court took also into account only the seat, but also the terms and conditions of agreement. Just like any other Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court took into account all the relevant aspects. So, it's not like in a science, if you choose seed, that's not necessarily automatically lead to the conclusion that the law of the seat will be the governing law of arbitration agreement, but I would say it is quite likely. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Um, Paul, Masako, any thoughts on, on you know, these recent court updates in the UK or just generally on law of the arbitration agreement? Paul, maybe some thoughts on where Singapore is headed? <laughs> well, no, no, not, not particularly. Um, it's safe, safe to say that uh, Nick is absolutely correct that um, actually um, there was an assistant registrar years ago who first um, uh, looked at the, the idea that, that perhaps um, the law of the seat should be given more prominence um, in uh, selecting what the law of the arbitration agreement should be in the absence of express agreement between the parties. Uh, that was then expressly uh, overruled um, by a high court judge um, in BCY. Uh, and then uh, subsequently, um, that decision by the high court judge was, was endorsed and applied uh, in BMA, which, um, which applying that found that it was the case that I discussed at the outset, applying, applying Sul America found that it was PRC law that, that 
that applied. Mm -hmm. So, um, so whether we uh, the assistant registrar was ahead of his time uh, may well be. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, the the lower judge is going to be right. Um, so, so we'll see. I don't know, but um, but it, but the sole marital position does have the the authority of the court of appeal um, at the moment and very recently so. So I think we'll just have to wait to see whether okay. the court of appeal um, eventually aligns itself with the English position, which which sure. I suspect it might. Um, I think the, I think uh, the the reasons um, set out in Chap are, are quite are very compelling, mm -hmm. uh, and and um, as Nick says, I think. We've, you know, if you go back to the idea of what the arbitration, why why we have um, the idea of separability uh, and the doctrine of separability, which is to make sure that the arbitration agreement works, even if the uh, matrix agreement or the container agreement doesn't, uh, then I think that there is a lot of um, logic to to the idea that the um, law of the arbitration agreement um, should perhaps follow the law of the seat, and and it just makes it. Um, a lot more easier to apply as well. Practically, uh, you yeah. don't have to keep switching between laws, even though that in itself is not conceptually impossible. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, unless there are any further comments, we can move on to to Q and A from the viewers. Anybody? All right. Oh. Okay. Um, let's see. We've got a first question here. Uh, that once somebody is asking what happens if we use the phrase uh, in the arbitration agreement place of arbitration as opposed to explicitly saying seat um, are we at risk of you know potentially being confused for venue or is it going to be clear that it's the seat anybody want to answer that question i'm happy to have a go at it michelle uh, <laughs> i would say in in, in most jurisdictions, there should be relatively limited risk. That, and indeed, the, the BNA, the BNB case in Singapore that uh, Paul has described is broad, I didn't use the word case, but referred to arbitration in Shanghai mm -hmm. uh, with the determination uh, that Paul has described. So I think the risk is low uh, with two footnotes. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you would be safer using the term seat or perhaps legal place, inserting the word legal before place. The second footnote is, uh, as some participants in the webinar will be aware, there was a decision of a lower court in India in Mumbai a couple of years ago in a case called Karzan Rent, uh, where that court uh, held that place meant only place, and it was there for to determine legal seat. Uh, as I recall, in that case provided for place of Singapore, uh, but it was nonetheless uh, determined that the seat was to be Mumbai. I think that decision is an aberration, uh, mm -hmm. but it was a decision that was made and demonstrates the point, I think, that there is some risk, uh, but I would quantify it as relatively low risk, um, which, which, which can be avoided by, by choosing the, the language seat or, or, or legal place. Yeah, sure. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, another question which relates to, you know, this, this COVID era where you are starting to see uh, more virtual hearings, online dispute resolution. Um, does the fact that you're going to be having a virtual hearing or anticipate potentially having virtual dispute res resolution, does that change the factors to select the seat? The question is, you know, does, what are the factors to, for selecting the seat when you're looking at online dispute resolution? Maybe Yoshimi or Paul? Yes. Or... <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, if I may. Um, well, you know, eventually, we, everyone hopes that COVID-19 is will be over. And we, well, we find, you know, virtue of um, virtual, inter, uh, virtual hearings, but we cannot, you know, forego um, in-person hearing, the benefit of in-person uh, in hearing. So this could be a tentative issue. But um, I think now that, you know, people are using um, virtual hearing, conducting virtual hearing, physical convenience has little relevance in choosing seat of arbitration. Perhaps people will more focus on sophistication mm. of the practice of the seat or right. sophisticated guidance or services available at the seat 
like SISC provides um, some guidance uh, to users. Um, and that kind of, you know, guidance offered by from the seat uh, will be the one of the key elements that uh, we will take into account. So, you know, the sophistication, I would say, and quality of services matter, not really the physical, you know, facility, how grand the physical facility is. I, I believe that would be at least the case for um, during the time when we have to, you know, deal with this COVID-19. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a related question, um, if someone is asking, you know, might we potentially see clauses that name, you know, Singapore is a seat, uh, but say the venue is, is a virtual hearing, you know, going forward coming out of COVID-19. Um, Masako, is that something you, you would put in your, in your contract? Um, I've never tried though, but you know, uh, going forward, I, I would uh, like to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, okay. um, it, uh, you know, um, as uh, Yoshimi said, you know, um, the sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, selecting the good seat is a sort of a key uh, to the uh, successful case. So um, I would say, you know, the level of the service or quality of the uh, service uh, of the institution or, or maybe the seat, uh, 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 seat uh, in, uh, including a sort of institution, um, it's so important, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, during the, such kind of, you know, uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, era, um, TIAC, uh, you know, um, as a business as, uh, you know, as usual. So <laughs> it's so amazing, I would say. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Um, okay, let's move on to another question. Let's see here. Um, in a scenario, someone is asking in a scenario where one of the parties uh, challenges the validity of the arbitration agreement, who would decide that challenge? Is it the arbitral tribunal deciding the validity in accordance with the law of the arbitration agreement? Or would it be the court of the, of the seat, uh, a court in the seat deciding the validity? Um, is anybody, any volunteers to, to answer that question for the audience? Uh, perhaps maybe Paul, you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in, in most jurisdictions following, uh, you know, the, the doctrine of competence, competence you, you, you would expect that the tribunal will get the first shot um, at determining questions of validity, enforceability, et cetera, of the arbitration agreement. Um, and, and it's up to, to the parties to then uh, decide if they want to bring that further um, to the courts. Um, so I, I think in, in most places that, that would be the sequence um, of events. Um, I, sorry, I just wanted to, to go back a little bit to the uh, question on, on, um, on the seat of arbitration given COVID-19. Um, um, and I, I think what um, Masako has said um, is, is extremely pertinent, which is that I think what the pandemic has done uh, is to highlight even more uh, the importance of choosing the correct seat um, because you never know when you will have to, your dispute will arise and when you will have to commence proceedings. Uh, and I think you want to be in a jurisdiction in which um, you can expect the courts, not, not just the institution, but the courts also to be working uh, and to be capable of working when you need your injunctions, your reliefs, uh, enforcement and so on. So, uh, so I think that that um, highlights that, that prospect. Um, the other thing I would say is that, um, and this perhaps is not related to COVID-19 per se, uh, but at the moment there are a number of cases in which um, some parties will be resisting having virtual hearings, um, whether that is strategic or not. Um, often uh, raising questions of whether uh, it would be fair to have hearings online because of the difficulties in logistics, in uh, hearing, um, you know, uh, the, the video going fuzzy and, and cross-examination not being as smooth as it would be in person. Uh, and you can imagine uh, some recalcitrant uh, respondents 
uh, may take these uh, decisions to proceed uh, with a virtual hearing as ground for challenge later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, uh, again, the, uh, highlighting the importance of choosing a jurisdiction where you can be confident uh, that these sorts of challenges will be uh, dealt with uh, in the way that it should be dealt with. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yes, so, yes. so I, I, I'm not sure that in and of itself, uh, the pandemic uh, necessarily affects our choice of um, jurisdiction, but uh, I think it just highlights or accentuates uh, some of the existing considerations that, that we already uh, take into account. Sure, sure. Great, thanks for that comment. Um, let's, let's take one last question from the audience. Um, and the question is, um, you know, as the panelists have discussed, the approach to determining the law of the arbitration agreement varies in different jurisdictions. Um, is there any sort of universal approach that's acknowledged in the international commercial arbitration, I guess, community? Maybe. I, think there, I, I think there really isn't, Michelle. Um, the, the, the simplest resolution, as always, is for parties to consider it up front uh, and draft into their arbitration clauses a governing law of the arbitration clause, which is as simple as saying this arbitration clause shall be governed by the law of X. I think that's a universal principle. Beyond that, it's very hard to divine universal principles. Uh, with one uh, final remark I will make, which is it would be possible for institutional rules to tackle the point. As far as I'm aware, there's only one set of institutional rules that do, and that's the Akika rules, the Australian Centre for International Commercial Arbitration rules, uh, which provide a default rule in that, that, that set of institutional rules that aligns with what we've now seen as the English position in ENCA v Chubb. In other words, uh, in the absence of an express election by the parties, that the law of the seat will be the governing law of the arbitration clause. It would be possible for other institutions to do that, uh, uh, but until, unless and until they do, I, I really don't think there is a universal mm -hmm. principle. Mm -hmm. So my own follow-up question here, in that case, you know, where you have a contract that specifies governing law uh, and then the seat as two different, different laws, would you recommend to parties to, that they might want to also specify law of the arbitration agreement, just to be clear, because now we know we have these two, we have these two approaches, go with the law of the seat as a presumption or go with the governing law as a presumption? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Going forward. Clearly yeah, clarity. Yeah, you know. <laughs> We need to, you know, specify the governing law of the arbitration clause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. And the practice, uh, but uh, my personal view is, you know, practically speaking, the law of the seat of the arbitration would be suitable for to govern the arbitration agreement, though. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually agree with uh, the, uh, one of the reasoning uh, reasonings of the Court of Appeals judgment, which says that parties choose particular arbitral seats because of their legal infrastructure, arbitration law, or sure. something like that. So. Great. That's it's, it's quite interesting, um, Masako, because um, sometimes when, when I speak to, to others, they, it's the opposite reaction, which is, oh, but we've already chosen the governing law of the contract. Why do we need to specify mm -hmm. uh, what the law of the arbitration agreement is? So I, I'm not sure whether it's just different frames of, of mind because of um, how um, our law has, uh, our respective laws have developed, and so we, we operate in, in a certain <laughs> with a certain bias. Uh, but but it seems, but absolutely, Michelle. I think uh, you know to the extent uh, we are able to advise, uh, I think we definitely should be specifying what the law of the arbitration agreement would, should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just add yeah. one point to what Nick was saying about uh, in your question about is there any universal approach. Uh, I don't think so. I think that goes back to your question about what, what, what does it mean to look at all the circumstances, which I think is the general prevailing approach, if, if one can call it an approach. Um, and I was just going to, to uh, well, in a sense, recommend uh, uh, an example of, of that, which is um, perhaps to just look at, uh, you know, PO3 in the uh, Philip Morris and Australia case. Um, I think that was a, a, an illustration of how the tribunal in that case sort of balanced the various considerations, including um, what procedural disadvantages there might be if you chose one over the other. Um, in the end, it was a very fine decision, 
Uh, and I think the, the tribunal ended up saying, well, we feel that in that case, it was Singapore would, would be slightly um, the more appropriate decision. Only uh -huh. because given the, the, where the parties were, it didn't make sense to say we had to travel to the other side of the world to find a seat, but we should try to find a seat that was in the part of the world where everyone was. Um, mm -hmm. And unless there was some demonstrable prejudice, you know, uh, in terms of the court infrastructure or experience, etc., uh, that that should be the chosen seat. So it's uh, it, it, it's it was it can sometimes be quite a fine balance, uh, and not really not really a, a science in that sense. Very and very fact intensive. It's really going to vary uh, case by case depending on the circumstance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, I agree on the Paul's point in particular. Court always try to you know interpret the arbitration agreement in a way it is valid, and mm -hmm. sometimes court you know um, deliberately choose governing law to make the arbitration agreement valid. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps you know uh, one single universal rule could be um, for the court to apply the the law which could um, survive the arbitration agreement. And that is often, you know, uh, it tends to be this, the, the law of the seat because parties tend to choose the seat because the seat has a good arbitration law, good arbitration practice. Mm -hmm. If you apply the law of the seat, that it is likely that the arbitration agreement survives. Mm -hmm. So perhaps, you know, it's not really theory, it's theoretical, you know, perspective. It's, but in reality, court try to apply the law, which could, um, you know, uh, keep arbitration agreement alive. Sure. Yeah. Great. Um, any any final comments to wrap up before we sign off? No. Okay. Well, um, we're just about at, uh, you know, almost 10 minutes over and we had a really lively and interesting and informative discussion. So I want to thank, um, thank, thank you all for, for joining us and, and sharing your experiences and your insights and your knowledge um, with the viewers today. And um, I hope you have a rest, great rest of the evening. And to the viewers, uh, please continue to join us for the SIAC International Arbitration Webinar Series. Um, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.